Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Joe Nick Petoskey. He's going to talk about his history with the great Doug Som. My memories of Doug Som certainly begin with hearing She's About a Mover by the Sir Douglas Quintet. I, I, I love consuming music. I love listening to radio. That was a big radio hit. When it came out, there was no knowledge, you know, one, that we didn't know that they were passing as English, but we certainly didn't know. I didn't know they were from Texas. And I didn't know much about, I remember, uh, I didn't know much about them in, in the whole, uh, Sam, I remember Men- Mendocino coming out as a, as a pop record, but I didn't know about these albums and stuff. And I opened up a record shop a little corner record shop in Fort Worth in uh, 1971. And I'd get promos, and I'd go to Dallas to, to the distributors to buy records once a week and get stuff. And, you know, I'd order three or four units instead of 500 units, but these people would tolerate me. Well, I remember getting the promo album of The Return of Doug Saldana, which was, this was Doug's album that he did when he came back to San Antonio from San Francisco, 1971. The album cover is what got me at first, because here's a guy on a porch, a front porch, and he's got pointy-toed cowboy boots. He's got this kind of Ernest Tubb, Texas Troubadour cowboy hat on. He's got long hair. He's got jewelry on and rings and stuff. And check shirt, you know, snap, uh, pearl snap shirt. And it was this combination of what he was doing. And he was holding a big red, a bottle of big red. That inspired me to go down to the corner to the convenience store and buy a bottle of big red. And and I started getting in this Doug Song guy because the look and everything and this one song on the album, I mean, it was a good album, but this one song just kind of grabbed me because it started with this intro, uh, piano, dong, dong. And this song is written, and then a voice in, in an echo chamber. This song is written by the great Freddie Fender. Freddie, this is for you wherever you are. And then he goes, wasted days and wasted night. And then he also gets back on the audio uh, when the sax player takes his break. West Side Rocky, take it away. Well, that's Rocky Morales, this, who became one of my guiding compasses, is just one of the coolest music people I've ever met. And uh, he was uh, he was a real native of the west side of San Antonio. And I'd known about Freddie Fender just from, I knew about the Rio Grande Valley. And Freddie Fender was like this guy that was the all-purpose musician in the 1960s. And like instead of the Beatles, you had Freddie Fender. And the name, Freddie Fender. And then you see it, he's a Mexican guy. I mean, what's going on here? But I love this song, Weiste Dies and Weiste. And it just sung to me. It spoke to me. And, you know, I wanted to be that. So when I'm a, I moved to Minneapolis and I get this job at the Electric Fetus when uh, the Doug Solomon Band album comes out. And I'm following this because I'm running this record store. Uh, we carry Rolling Stone and someone convinced me to start carrying Cream Magazine. And I'm, I'm a voracious consumer. I'm reading all this. It makes it's a lot of, Chet Flippo makes me homesick whenever I read him. And uh, uh, Doug Simon Band's coming out. And I'm getting all the promos because I'm at the Electric Fetus. And uh, and I get this uh, Mercury release, mm-hmm. Rough Edges, mm-hmm. just as Doug Simon Band and Bob Dylan and Dr. John and all this. That album comes out on Atlantic. Mercury is basically getting rid of all their old outtakes from the Doug Soms catalog from when he was in San Francisco from 66 to 1971, and it's called Rough Edges. And just, you know, in a way, and I'm listening to it, and it's like, you know, in a lot of ways, this shit's better than that Doug Simon band album, and it's just like, you know, this crazy off-the-wall stuff. You know, here he's trying to be like Bob Dylan on this song, and it's just it was all over the map. And you're doing it too hard, goodbye San Francisco, hello Amsterdam, wanting to groove with the girls along the canal. It was so just goofy. I was inspired, and I wanted to write, and I'd done a little bit of writing. I'd written for a, a free giveaway magazine in um, in Dallas called Buddy Magazine. Uh, there was a music magazine, and 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 got hate mail on a, from a giveaway magazine on my first uh, review because it was on uh, this, this band from Fort Worth that I knew, Robert Ely and his Five Careless Lovers, 
basically dissing all other you know mainstream music in favor of this. People could not believe. You know, how can I talk about this? But you know, getting a reaction. Hmm, this is interesting. So on a whim, I wrote uh, a review in the Cream style of this album, Rough Edges, and I sent it in over the Transom to Cream magazine. And about, oh, I don't know how many, maybe a month later, I got a $30 check and a letter from this guy, Lester Bang, saying, this is, you know, you write pretty well. You ought to do some more stuff for us. And boy, talk about empowering. That's when it's like, no, time to go home. And, you know, don't go to L.A., Nashville, no interest at all. New York, why bother? Go to Texas and be like Chet Flippo. You know, there's a scene happening here. And it was really Chet's description of Soap Creek Saloon on a night that that was the one most vivid in my mind. So I went to Soap Creek. It was almost as, within the week after arriving here. My girlfriend and I moved in August of 73. We went out to Soap Creek to see Doug. And Doug was everything that I imagined to be and more. And he was fun and it was hot and sweaty, and it was like all kinds of Texas music. It was rock and roll, but there was a lot of blues. And he throws in this Tex-Mex stuff that really is kind of, this This is really appealing. And just the sound in this bar, and it's, it was a real pressure cooker atmosphere. And I became a regular pretty quick. I got to know George and Carla Majeski, who ran, ran the club. And uh, I think I wrote a a little promo for him for the Daily Texan when Clifton Chenier was coming. Uh, and it was it was so chopped up by the Daily Texan. That's where I decided I'm going to write for the the college magazine rather than the college newspaper. But it also, doing that for So Creek, I could get in. I got to know Billy Bob, the, the doorman, so he'd always let me in. And I became, you know, that was, that was one of my campgrounds. Uh, Armadillo was a regular stop, especially when there were, certain bands that were playing their in the concert hall. You didn't hang at the Armadillo as much as you did at Soap Creek because the Soap Creek was more like a secret. You know, it was, it was you know, uh, Fort Hood Army soldiers went and hung out at the Armadillo. They didn't know Soap Creek existed. And Soap Creek was kind of like a secret, and they bring in the, like, cool acts. Introduced Delbert McClinton to Austin. Joe Ely Band, first time they played Austin as Joe Ely Band. That's, that's where they came and built up a following. Uh, Professor Longhair, uh, Clifton Chenier, first time. But Doug Somm lived 100 yards from, from this club. He had rented this beautiful mansion overlooking, you could see downtown Austin. On, it was a hilltop view. And as Doug said at the time, Dylan came out here and thought, you know, this is really a cool setup. Dylan comes and hangs out with Doug. Doug is like, he knows all these people. Doug and Dylan were friends from, from you know, 65 or 66 when movers started hitting. They, they hung out. They ran together. And so here's a guy that basically he can walk down the path whenever he wants to play. And he's playing here pretty regularly. And what, what the real reveal was to me is there were many Dougs. So some nights Doug would play with Frieda and the Fire Dogs, who were, that was the first band that played country music that were young, hip people. Marsha Ball was a piano player. Uh, this was a four-piece, and they play at the split rail. And this was a first real. And I, I, can't, I was visiting here in 70 or 71 and walked in the split rail. Never a cover charge. Asphalt dance floor. And this place on a Sunday night was just jam-packed. And the crowd was so into it. And, you know, Marsha Ball singing Stand By Your Man. You know, these were college kids playing straight country, and they were really good. And then this, their guitar player, John Reed, would play some Buddy Holly and get the audience all jacked up. And this is the first place I really saw the melding of, of the differences. This was before Willie plays the armadillo. And this is where I thought that the split rail had a traditional country audience that had hung out there, but the cool kids were hanging out there too. And I, I learned it from Marsha. Marsha said she was afraid to go there at first because, you know, she was a hippie from Baton Rouge. But uh, Bobby Charles, who was hanging out in this Louisiana hippie pad in Austin, said, you need to go down to the split rail and hear this guy, Kenneth Threadgill. Kenneth Threadgill was basically the grandfather 
of Austin music, this old yodeler who ran a beer joint out on uh, North Lamar. And he started Hootin' Nannies in the 60s. That's where Janis Joplin came of age and kind of came matured as a music, music person. Mr. Threadgill was responsible for that. So Kenneth Threadgill started the split rail as this mixed audience. I got there in time for Freedom the Fire Dogs. And there was a very storied time when Doug Somm shows up at the split rail with Jerry Wexler and Dr. John in, in tow. And this got Austin excited. What's he doing here? And Wexler was about to sign Doug. Uh, and, you know, Dr. John's hanging out with him. And Doug discovered Freedom the Fire Dogs. And it's like, these guys know my old music. You know, I'm a child prodigy on pedal steel who sat on Hank Williams' knee and had Hank Williams compliment his playing direct transmission. Uh, he finds these guys and it's a marriage made in heaven. So whenever Doug is in his country groove, he, as Marsha Ball said, he stole my band. Uh, he's using Freedom the Fire Dogs. But on other nights at Soap Creek, he brings up his San Antonio crew, and it's these Mexican-American players who look like gangsters almost, and these three horns, uh, well, two particular horns, Rocky Morales, who I'd heard West Side Rocky on the Wasted Days, Wasted Nights, and a guy named Charlie McBurney, who's, despite his last name, you know, has a very heavily accented English, what manner of speaking English, McBurney and, and, and uh, Morales are the core of what's called the West Side Horns. And that's the West Side sound, which Doug articulated. It's an R&B sound, but the horns, they're part of this Highway 90 thing. It starts in New Orleans with New Orleans classic jazz horns and rhythm and blues horns, especially records. You go to Houston, you get the new peacock horns, which are a little slicker and more... Uh, more orchestrated, you know, Joe Scott and, and other arrangers. But by the time you get to San Antonio, those horns turn sour because they're getting some of that mariachi sound from, uh, and horns in San Antonio sound like nowhere else. So Doug would bring his horn cats and, you know, we'd flip. And it was a whole different R&B sound that wasn't freeing in the fire dogs. And then, you know, there was a time when he brought this guy, Flaco Jimenez, to come up and play with him. And that takes on a whole different texture. So it's, what's Doug's mood tonight? Who's he going to be? There were nights that he wanted to be Mick Jagger and would do all, you know, all these Rolling Stone things and, and pretend he was like a rock and roller on stage in front of, you know, thousands of people instead of 200 people. And the beauty of watching Doug, all these different iterations was, uh, Doug was always into the music first. You know, he, he'd make enough money to get by. But that, making money and being famous, I'm sure he wanted to be famous whenever it happened, but... Uh, after Huey Moe and, and dressing British in 1965 as a Sir Douglas Quintet in order to, to come over and, ma and make a hit, he never let anyone control him like that. So sometimes he'd get money to make a blues album, and he'd take the money and then he'd make a country album because that's what I want to make. He was the authentic Texan. He sat on Hank Williams' knee as a, a child prodigy on the lap steel, uh, and he made his first record when he was 12 years old. He was a regular on the, briefly a regular on the Louisiana Hayride, and Jimmy Wakeley tried to get him to go to to move with him to Los Angeles, but his mother said uh, she wanted him to finish high school. Well, the problem is in high school the family moved uh, over to the East Side, and in high school Doug lived across the field from the Eastwoods Country Club that was on the Chitlin Circuit, so he could walk across this field and hear Gatemouth Brown. T-Bone Walker, the articulator of the electric blues guitar, and uh, uh, all these other players on the circuit would come through. He heard them. And it's not like he heard them. He could watch them. And that's not like listening to records. Again, direct transmission. That's kind of what we've had the advantage of in Texas in a lot of ways. A lot of times because we were denied the, <laughs> the luxury of listening to records all the time. But he had that direct transmission, and it showed. So... Doug was authentic, and uh, he wasn't like, well, I heard this from record. I love, uh, in Minneapolis when I was up there, who were the big, who were the, was the big act? Well, it was John, Spider John Kerner, uh, Tony Glover, Dave Snaker Ray, who I got to meet Dave, 
And, you know, these are the guys that turned on Bob Dylan. And this Bob Dylan came to Minneapolis to go to college. And that's who he heard. That was his, that was his North Star, Colonel Ray and Glover. And you'd hear, and Dave, Dave Ray came and played an anniversary party at the uh, uh, Electric Fetus. And I heard Snake Ray play, and it's, God damn, man. He sounded like an old Mississippi blues man. This is great. But his transmission, he learned from records. He didn't learn directly. And that's a Texas difference, kind of. So I'm after hearing these guys, and I like Colonel Ray and Glover. They're great musicians. But Doug Sob is the shits. You know, that's there's no comparison in my mind because he took all these sounds and kept absorbing them and would go back and... and pay homage to them, even while he was trying to do new stuff. So the education at Soap Creek was off the charts. And I began to think, I, I knew Doug's catalog, and I knew the songs that he grew up with pretty well. And Doug, you could always shout requests, and especially if they were obscure ones, he'd like to play them, and he'd just, you know, he'd go right into it. And that part of him, I just loved. You know, so, you know, you get beyond shoes about her, how about the tracker? Okay, you know, and he, you know, he had a pretty good catalog at that time, and I was working my way through it, doing it too hard. Well, he didn't really like that one, but occasionally, you know, he'd play that one once. He'd play the outtake stuff, but uh, and I stumped him once on. I kept uh, requesting a song called "Down Down the Pike," which was on the flip of his version of "Cry," which he'd done in the early '60s before the quintet, the Johnny Ray song, you know, uh, with with horns, and he did "Cry." on the Renner label in San Antonio. Uh, and I guess Renner sold the masters uh, to Major Bill Smith in uh, Fort Worth, who was kind of a low rent Huey Mo. And uh, Major Bill took the two tracks and instead of, you know, reissuing them on a soft label as one record, he put them out as two records and then put his own instrumental on the flip. And that was down the pike, a generic instrumental. So whenever I, I, I finally, you know, done down the pike. And I said, well, how come you, I don't know that song. And then I finally figured out, you know, Major Bill basically stuck a song on there, put Doug's name on it, but Doug never recorded it. So that was the only time that I know that I ever stumped him. I don't know a specific story behind Uncle Tupelo and Doug, but what I do know is that, uh, you know, if you were into Doug and you met him, he, he, he liked the attention and it, I think it was a matter of just reaching out to him because not many people reached out to let's collaborate. And Tupelo hit him at a really good time because what kind of follow? that's about the same time when uh, he starts playing with the Gords here in Austin and like doing gigs with them. And he like, because this is now, he's, he's aged to the point where he knows he's an elder and he's going through a lot of different reinventions. You know, he's big in, in Scandinavia, doing kind of Scandinavian music. He, he's, he goes off to Canada to do his project with uh, Amos Garrett. He's, he's moving around and he's reinventing, but, you know, someone, a younger, someone younger wants to work with. He's, he's kind of flattered, I think. He's, he said, sure. And that's kind of similar to Los Lobos had, had kind of a relationship. When he heard Los Lobos, it's, yeah, hey, they sound like me. And he, he kind of takes after them. And, and there is a true friendship. And it was, it was Caesar and uh, David told me uh, when they were recording Los Super, Seven, Los Super Seven's Border Radio album, they did a track. And it was a traditional track. And they wanted Doug on it. Doug said, Sure. Uh, what's the deal? Well, we're at, at Cedar Creek, uh, and we're going to be cutting the track today. Well, let me know when you need me. Okay, we'll come over about now. <laughs> and they said, you know, we, we we knew him well enough and all that. We really wanted him to just sing this uh, this one line uh, and really make the song. So uh, Doug shows up at the studio in his Lincoln Continental, and he leaves the car running. All right, he comes on in. What do you need? Do it. Okay, goes in there, nails it, gets in the car, drives off. And that's it, one take. But, you know, that's he was expedient in the studio. He was never indulgent. And he was never like, get the track and let's do it. If you gave him the opportunity, he probably would do 20 or 30 takes. But he was basically a down and dirty recorder. And, you know, the Lobo said that was just 
perfect and he nailed the thing and he knew what he had to do. And he did it and he's gone. And that's Doug. He, he's, he, he's a very ethereal presence. And, you know, as much as he came close to being a legend or fame, he never really achieved that. And, and yet that's what, to me, makes him so appealing as a character. Because he's one that, uh, you know, all these interactions. Uh, you know, there was a Atlantic Nashville. It was Willie and Doug. And Doug was the guy that brought Wexler to town. Doug wasn't Willie. 1975, Willie does Redheaded Stranger and changes the course of modern music. 1975, Doug uh, produces the first Rocky Erickson album after Rocky is in the Rest School for Rest Institute for the Mentally Criminally Insane. Doug produces Two Headed Dog and Starry Eyes, and he releases his own album. It's a one-off on Warner's called Groover's Paradise which is all about Austin. And there the two paths diverge. And it's interesting how that happened uh, uh, and why it happened. And again, I think Willie had wanted to go, he wanted to go get it. And he was on fire and Doug was as creatively on fire, but that business in, eh, not so much. It's, it's the next gig. It's the next deal. After Warner's, he does a single on uh, 75, 76. He does a single on Casablanca. Kisses label. Village people. Casablanca. A single called Roll with the Punches. And I asked him a few years ago, Augie, what was the deal with Casablanca Records? He said, oh, it was a money deal. What do you mean? He said, oh, Neil Bogart, back when he was in, in the Army, he used to come to our gigs at the Officers Club in San Antonio. We let him sit in. So, you know, payback. You know, he gave us a deal for to put out a single. So that was Doug's life. And then, you know, the next one is with ABC uh, because Huey Moe has gotten big with the rediscovery of Freddie Fender, which happens because of Doug's psalm. Uh, so Huey gives uh, a deal when Doug puts out an album on ABC. But that last, that's, that's one record deal. And that's Doug. He's just making deals. And yeah, then it's Tacoma, then it's Sonnet in Sweden, and then it's Stony Plain in, in Canada. And to me, as a not just a, a music listener and fan, but knowing the record business, and, and you know, I'm, uh, as a former collector, I really appreciate Doug's discography and history because it's all over the place. It's not, it's not, there's not a real linear line there. 